Wow. We need to do that, don't we? Sometimes. We just need to proclaim what we know is true. And to do it together is so powerful. So powerful. Today we're going to talk about, uh, again, um, living with one another. We thought appropriate after our More Than We Imagine series, talking about all that we're going to do in the future and our future is so bright. We talked about what our church could look like in the future, even our, even our campus to repurpose, what our campus might look like, what our, what our, our you know, ministries might look like. We've talked a lot about that in recent days. And so we followed it here intentionally with the fact that what we do, I could argue, doesn't matter nearly as much as how we do what we do. Because in the Christian life, yes, what we do matters. We'll talk a lot about that today. But it's not so much what we do, it's who we are becoming. That's the Christian life. Because we're human, you've heard it, human beings. We're not human doings. And the twist in Christianity is that we are becoming who now God says we are. Totally forgiven, fully graced by his love and we start to live into that that changes everything and so today we're going to talk about something that we do a lot together and it's it's speaking with one another we're gonna we talk to one another and words have power right i was doing some research um called google and uh i was reading i found an article um that said some years ago and it said that that um, we speak 7,000 words a day. That's a lot of, that's a lot of words. Um, and then I, I dove a little deeper in. One article said that, that actually men speak 7,000 words a day and women speak 20,000 words a day. Now I thought, meh. So I, then I really did dive into to more research and I couldn't, I couldn't validate that. In fact, I found other articles that, didn't, that, that noted that. Um, where that came from. And so in my corroborating research, I have found that it is true that women speak more than men, but it's only negligible. We have these stereotypes, I think. Like I'm, you know, I have twin daughters, many of you know, and when they were in middle school, high school, I remember taking around elementary school, middle school, and we had double the fun because two, and then all the friends like came over to our house and we, we needed to buy a bigger car, you know, that kind of thing. And I remember in the car with them often during those days, because generally speaking, um, my girls are generally speaking. And so when, when they're all together with friends, I remember this, like they're all speaking right now at the same time. This is unbelievable. This is wild how that happens. I don't know how, how you, you guys could do that. But, um, but today, but, you know, however it parses out, we, we use a lot of words. We talk a lot to one another, right? And it's important. It's so critical that we think deeply about our words. And so let me set this up a little bit. We're going to end up in Ephesians 4, if you want to turn there. But um, Proverbs 18, 21 says this. The tongue has the power of life and death. Think about this. And the tongue, every word that we speak has the power of life or death. And those who love it, that's another way of saying those who, who utilize it, those who eat it up, they bear the fruit. Our words have consequences for good or bad. And some of us are still reeling and have come to believe lies about ourselves because of words spoken to us when we were young, perhaps. So it's an instrument of good or bad. And then James is more explicit. Listen to this. I mean, it's one thing, life or death, that's pretty intense. James 3, you might know this passage. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest fire or a or forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Just a little spark of a word is what he's saying here. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. Wow. This is serious stuff we're talking about today. I think it's a good reminder for us to remember that a careless word, a wrongly placed word can ruin someone's world. It can ruin someone's day. We've had this happen to us, haven't we? It can turn harmony into chaos in a group or in a church or in, a, in an office place. It can cancel someone's reputation. It can either bring life 
or death. This is serious stuff. So if you listen carefully, some of us need to take notes on this, this sermon because we need to remember, we need to hold on to it, and we need to apply it. That's what we're going to do. And there's a singular application. We're going to apply the text as we always do. We're going to then land with uh, the Lord's Supper together as, a, as an appropriate way to, uh, to respond to this passage. We're going to do a personal inventory today. All right? Are you ready for this? Because we're going to read, I'm going to read from Ephesians 4. I'm just going to read this over you. How about that? I'm going to speak the word of God over you. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. You might know that we're reading now in our dwell readings in Ephesians and Isaiah. The Isaiah piece is leading us into to Advent. Listen to this. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. And give no opportunity for the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor. Doing honest work with his own hands. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Your mouths. But only such is good for building up. As it fits the occasion. That it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is the word of God. So this passage is calling us to a radical life of transformed speech. And this is going to be convicting, challenging, and I trust it's going to change the way we talk forever. We're going to see in this passage that we are to speak with integrity, we're to speak with encouragement, and we're to speak with grace, all right? So first, we speak with integrity, I'm using this word intentionally. We think honesty, right? But here's the thing. And what we see throughout this passage, we are integrated people. Uh, we, we are whole people. What comes out of our mouths are attached to who we are. Jesus said it in Matthew 12, 34, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in your heart will come out of your mouth. Another way to say it, I suppose, flip it. What comes out of your mouth reveals your heart. Even though we seek to deceive ourselves and say, I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I should have never said that. No, it was in your heart. That's why you said it. You see, we are integrated, holistic people. So we got to speak words of integrity that match up with who we are becoming. So look at verse 25. Let's unpack it. Therefore, all right, one of Paul's favorite words because he has said in, in verse 17, you have your Bible open, you can see this. He says, now live this new life. You no longer live the lives you once lived. In verse 22, he says, put off. Okay, this is important to understand. Key to this passage and key to application. Put off and then put on, verse 24, the new life that you've been created. Then he says in verse 25, check this out. Having already put off. This is the word, put away. You might have, have heard this is like putting on a, a garment of clothing. You know, like it's taking off a jacket, putting on another one. But it's more than that. This is tossing out. Like, I'm done with this. I'm not wearing that anymore. It's out. And that's what this is talking about. It's putting away falsehood because you now live in the truth. You, you're, you're taking off and you're putting on. Now, this is important to understand. Let me frame it this way. The Christian ethical system, Christian ethics, um, is radically different than any other ethic in the world in a very unique way. If you look at the ethical imperatives, the commands that were given, um, like Ten Commandments, they really align with most religions in the world. I mean, in, you know, whether it's Islam, I mean, Muslim people, uh, Judaism, Buddhist, don't steal, don't, don't lie. Don't, don't kill people. You know, all the things, right? Even, even we see it here, don't be lazy. So all the imperative commands in regard to ethics are really similar. The difference is, however, radical in the Christian life. And we talk about it often here. 
Because the Christian, Christian ethics does not begin or end with moral behavior. It begins with a changed heart. It begins by responding to what Christ has done for us, who lived the perfect ethical life for us. So we receive by faith his death on the cross for all of our garbage, because none of us live morally upright lives all the time. None of us. No one does. The Christian system says, okay, let's start with forgiveness and grace. Now I'm obeying him. See, the motivation shifts completely. And again, we talk about this often if you're new here. Um, I, don't, I don't try to obey or do these things to be morally upright in order to gain God's approval. I do it because I already have his approval. And we have a new identity in him, forgiven. I'm a child or a son of God. I, I, I am loved by him. So we don't seek to achieve our identity or relationship with him. We receive the relationship. Because he has come to us. He's preemptive. He's the one who's come to us. This is a radically different way to live. And it's why Paul always does this in his epistles. This has happened. Therefore, that's why he says this. Now live differently. Here's the wild thing about the Christian life. We're actually living out and becoming who we already are in him. How he already sees us. Fully whole and forgiven and and, and holy is where we're heading. To, to, and so we're to live this out. So we're actually becoming. And the way this happens, watch for this in this passage. It's not simply taking off the old garment, tossing it out. Stop sinning. That's, how, that's, that's religion, right? Some of us live our Christian life. Stop lying. Stop the addiction you've got. Just stop it. Stop it. It'll never work, right? How's that working for you? Instead, you've got to replace it with something else. And it's this new growth of who we're becoming. Okay. You're going to see it here. Watch for it in this passage. So I pause to explain all this because it's throughout this, this passage. All right. So the motivation shifts. Now, um, the image here is, is that deception of falsehood is something that we do put on. It's an article of clothing. So here's what happens oftentimes. Uh, and I challenge you, do you do this? You live or act or speak a different way, depending on who you're with. I think we all do this in varying degrees. What's funny is the pastor through the years, like I'll be out with someone or you know, some guy shanks a golf shot or whatever else and he cusses and he goes, oh, I'm with the pastor. Whoa, sorry about that. Like, like what? Like I'm not, I'm just a human being, right? But we have this idea or someone will say something in the church. I've heard this too through the years. Well, lightning's going to strike because I finally showed up here or, you know, or, or I said this in the church. I'm here in the church. This idea of duplicitous life. Some of you do that. You speak differently at home than you do at work. Some of you are kinder in the workplace with certain people than you are at home. And because our words are connected with who we are, and we all know it, it's why those closest to us are most hurt by our words, those that we should be loving. And, and instead, our words can hurt, especially those who are so close to us and so near and, and dear to us. But there's a lot of ways that we deceive in communication. And it's important to understand this too. Nowadays, we communicate in a lot of different ways. Now, it's always been the case. We communicate non-verbally as much as we do verbally, sometimes more so. And we deceive people. Uh, we see this really clearly in, our, in, like in social media platforms and such. Deception all the time about what your life is all about, what you're doing. It's, it's, it can be a, a deceptive way to live. You're not being integrous in the way you, you communicate, right? But you can also do this by pretending, deceiving someone by acting like you're being attentive. We do this all the time. Now it's not so clear when you're on your phone, you're clearly not listening or there's something else on television or whatever else. Sometimes we act like we're listening and we're not. If you're married, you've experienced this from your husbands and your wives. See, we can deceive in a lot of different ways. Some of you are acting like you're listening to me right now. Um, it can happen, right? We all do this. But the person that lies to you more than anyone in the world is yourself. And some of us have come to believe the words that we have heard and we keep playing them on repeat about ourselves. I'm not enough. Lie from the pit of hell is what scripture is telling us. I'll, I'll never be enough. 
I can never change. Lie from the pit of hell. I'll, I'll, I'll never be able to, to accomplish this thing or I'm not unlovable. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm unlovable. I'm not, I'm not lovable. I, these are all lies that we've come to believe and some of us have heard them from people. Some of us have seen them via text or whatever else and just hurtful stuff, maybe an email or who knows what. But we're to put off and we're to put on. The, the falsehood is countered by, did you catch it? By truth. We're to be actively speaking truth. And this is so important. I want you to understand, there's no neutral position here. You can't just not lie. You've got to speak truth instead. And we're going to see, speak love, speak kindness, or you'll never change. You'll continue to speak words that are hurtful. Look at verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Now, this portion feels like kind of a non sequitur. Like, wait, I thought he was talking about speaking. Jeff, I thought this was about speaking. It is. Because so much of what we, we say in our anger is what hurts the most. Look at this. Be angry and do... That's an imperative, by the way. Be angry. We'll talk about this. But do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Look, there's a time limit on this anger. Deal with it. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor. Are you watching the the replacement? Look at this. Doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Again, be angry is an imperative. Now, I've had to learn this, all right? Let you in on my my little journey. Um, I grew up in a home where I didn't see mom and dad didn't just go off on each other. I didn't, we didn't raise our, our voices in our home. Um, and so I think over time it's possible then to maybe not understand when you're really angry, how to deal with it. Maybe you, maybe there's this suppression of anger. Suppression of anger is very common, especially among, I think, Christians at times, but it's never healthy. We've got to deal with our anger and we all get angry. And one of the deceptive parts of this passage, this part of the passage, is that we deceive ourselves pretending we're not angry. How many of you have experienced this? Wow, you're mad. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not. Wow, you're angry. No, no, I'm not. We have other words for it because Christians can get frustrated. (laughs) Not angry. Uh, We can get, no, I just got a lot on my mind. No, you're angry. And this is something I've had to learn. It's important to name it, call it anger, call it that. See, again, I, maybe I'm the only one in the room. I'm, I'm getting some therapy as I say this from you, um, that I, I've come to believe over time that, you know, Christians don't really get angry, but here's the thing. Um, some things require anger. Here's what I've learned over, over time. In fact, say it this way. If you're not angry about certain things, you're wrong. We said it earlier, lament has a lot to do with anger and anger towards God. He's big enough for that. All of our questions, anger is always directed in some way. So you have to do, uh, do the hard work. In fact, a a great diagnostic question we've talked about recently, as we were talking about serving, how it defines us is what makes you angry in the world? Because that will help guide and inform your calling and ministry. Some of you, I'm sitting here earlier, some of us were angry, you could say, passionate about the fact that that maybe couples who can't have children um, are struggling with infertility. we, We need a place for them. And so a group was formed. Some of you are angry about the fact that children aren't always loved and cared for as they should be. You're serving in our preschool ministry. Or you ought to be. Some of us are angry about the fact that students today are growing up biblically illiterate, heading off into college, serving in our youth ministry. What what makes you angry? Think about it. Some of you, like me, you hate graceless religion. Makes me crazy. What are you going to do about it, right? Some of you are angry about oppression or injustice, about racism. Do something right? We direct our anger, replace it with something good. Now we'll talk about how we do this in our own personal lives and in our speech, but there's a group of women in our church recently 
You can see it in your bulletin today. They were angry, and again, is that the right word? They were passionate about the fact that single moms could show up in our church and feel like maybe there's not a place for you. And they said, not anymore. You know what they've done? They've started the connect group. I know another good friend of mine, a brother who decided, you know what? Maybe there needs to be a group, a place where some young men can gather on Sunday morning. We have great men's classes and others. Maybe there needs to be another one. Let's go. You see, it prompts us when we're, when we're upset, passionate, and let's call it ang- angry about something. Here's the good question. What did Jesus get angry about? Let's, let's align ourselves with that. He, he, he was angry about, again, graceless religion. He was angry about injustice in the world. You know, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King, he had principles of nonviolence during the civil, civil rights. Brilliant. And one of his principles of, of nonviolence can be applied into our personal relationships. He said, we're aggressive after issues and problems, not people. We go after issues and problems, injustices in the world, but we do not go after people. This is hard to do, isn't it? I had to tell someone this week, don't personify your, your, your anger and that you're upset with that person. God is sovereign over you. He's at work. Don't forget that. If that person hadn't done that, if this wasn't happening, I wouldn't be losing my job. If that didn't happen, then no, 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 no. You forgot. You forgot whose child you are, right? And so here's the thing. No emotion is inherently wrong. And I'm spending some time on this. Because I think it's so important. Um, We're going to buzz through the the latter points. But this one is so important. Even God gets angry. It's okay to be angry. David was at his very best when he was angry in the Psalms. At the enemies of God. He was even angry at God at times. There's no bad emotions. They're just emotions gone bad. Is what Tim Keller has said. So, so we, we, we look into our anger. All anger is defending something or attacking something. Some of y'all ought to be taking notes. I'm just telling you. Because we need to analyze our anger to apply this. You need to identify, name it, you're angry. You're not just frustrated or worried or whatever else. You're angry. Secondly, then, what are you defending? What are you trying to defend? And let me give you an illustration that probably would, would help you, Okay. Um, so let, let's say this past week, uh, you are at work or your school, whatever you're doing, and you're thinking about the game that's coming on that night. In fact, you're thinking about watching the world champion, Texas Rangers on television. Okay. Okay. So I'm finally getting, starting to get amens. Okay. Um, (laughs) you're thinking about it all day long. Like you're thinking, this is going to be amazing. I guess they could win it tonight. Then I can't wait. Um, I am going to get my work done. I'm going to get home early and I'm going to get my, you know, my, get something to eat. I'm going to get my favorite beverage, whatever else I'm doing. I'm ready. I'm locked in. Whoo, this is going to be great. I cannot wait till tonight. And you get there. Let's, let's then imagine that you're the pastor of, of a large church and you get a phone call right before game time. And, um, what are you going to do with that? Okay real life, but let's don't go that scenario. Um, let's, let's do this. Let's instead go to, let's say you're married. Okay. Not all of us are married. And let's say you're married and you have kids. All right. And your kids are, it's a school night and game time. Here we go. And the kids are just, they seem extra loud, um, tonight. They just seem like, and then they get into an argument as, as siblings do. They're going off. You tell them to calm down and the game is about to start. Then they, 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 you know, go at it again and you go off on them. They're just being kids. They have no idea you've been dreaming about your comfort and your contentment and your love for the Rangers. And you go off. Watch this. You angry. No, I'm just kind of frustrated. Just want to watch the game. Ah, you're deceiving yourself. You're angry. It's okay to be angry. You're, you're attacking something or you're defending something. Watch this. You're attacking your kids. That's displaced. That's misplaced anger. Misdirected anger. They are innocent, have no clue. 
We do this with our spouses, we do it with roommates, and we do it with our friends. This is why this is so important. Get underneath your anger. All right? I'm angry. What are you defending? I'm defending my right to watch the, ang- watch the, I mean, it's the World Series. Come on. I'm defending my right to my content moment and focus to cheer on the Texas Rangers. All right. Pause for a moment. This is hard to do. What's more important, the children that God has given you, <laughs> as he's gifted you with the task of being a parent, or watching a group of dudes run around on the field playing a game? What's more important? And I know you're thinking, Jeff, you're killing my vibe. Man, this is like this is like the World Series. Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. See, we 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 always are defending ourselves and then we redirect our anger elsewhere. And we need to the point is name it, name your anger, get do the hard work to get underneath your anger and why you're angry. And then here it is, replace it with something else. Or you'll remain angry. What do you replace it with? Did you see it here? With kindness. With words of kindness and words that are true. Don't give the devil an opportunity to to step in. And notice there's a time limit on it. And then this piece about about, uh, let the thief steal no more. It's hard to be. This is deception as well. It's hard to be an honest thief. Right? But did you see the replacement? What do you do? You steal with your hands. You work hard with your hands instead. Why do you work hard with your hands? He says, take care of yourself, okay, your family, and give. Give. I think it was Charles Wesley. He basically said, make as much as you can so you can give as much as you can. Work as hard as you can and make as much as you can so you can give as much as you can. We say it, if you have a little, give a little. If you have some, give some. Work hard and make a lot of money and give a lot of money away. That's the Christian way. And that's what he's saying here. So look, we replace it with something else. Now look at uh, this next point here. So we, we, um, we speak with words of integrity. We speak of words of encouragement. Look at this. Let no corrupting word come out of your mouth. This word corrupting is, is the word rotten or spoiled. So there's a play on words here. It's like food. Okay. Mouth, food, right? Another, your translation might say unwholesome. So it goes deeper than just, ooh, that's nasty. No, it's, is it good for you or not? Let no corrupting word come out of your mouth if it's not good for others. But only such as building up, there it is, to make stronger someone else as fits the occasion. It's a timely word that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here it is again. You've already been sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's who you are. And you're on a trajectory to be with him this day of redemption. When all things are made new, you're already there. So live that way. Live into it. Lean into it. So we discard bad food and we discard talk that is bad, that doesn't bring life. It's not good for someone. But what do we do? We replace it with what? Catch it? We replace it with the truth and with timely word, like good food for the soul. But watch this. Food is not, we don't, it's not always sweet. And this is an important word for us today. We, we don't always just eat sweet, sweets, right? We know this. It's not healthy for you. Sometimes it's hard, hard to swallow words that we might hear, but it's words that are true. And in the end, these words bring grace. All gifts that were given are gifts to be used and to encourage others. And even, the, word, even the, the ability to speak is a way to bless others. Grace is an empowering force, and it brings life to others. Every, every timely word that you will speak this week, friends, and it starts right after this service is over, every timely word you speak will, will be a moment of grace towards another person who desperately needs it. We speak with integrity, we speak with encouragement, and we'll close with this. We speak with grace. We're going to talk a lot about this next week which is why I'm going to buzz through this, this, these verses as we take the Lord's Supper together. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. He's using a lot of words here. He first talks about inner anger, which is bitterness. And then, then vengeance is what this would be, anger. Clamor is to shout out or outcry. It's, it's like speaking out anger. 
loudly. And some of us are prone to do that. Slander, of course, is saying something that's not true about someone and, and pretending or claiming that it's true. The word is blaspheme here is what the word is. So we're, we're twisting the truth and don't do it. But look at this. How do you not live a life like that? He tells us. You see the replacement? Instead, be kind to one another. Don't simply not. See, some of you, here's the challenge. I'll go ahead and here it is. This week, only words that are uplifting and encouraging. Every single word. See if you can do it for a week. And like any addict, we all struggle with this, start with an hour. Start with today. Can I do it? Only kind words. And here's the challenge. To someone that you're talking to, and then about someone when they're not with you. Only words of encouragement. Only words that are uplifting. We say it here. We do not triangulate. I speak to you, not about you. And then I'm always for you, never against you. And we need to have these principles in our homes, friends. Or our words will hurt one another and crush the hearts of our children and people around us. And so I'm going to close with this illustration and we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together. I, uh, I love the fact that it's fall. I used to say I don't like fall that much because that means winter's coming. And I don't like the shorter days, okay? Um, but I do like the cooler weather. It's not 100 degrees every day anymore, right? And I think hearkening back, coming from North Carolina, I miss the, I mean, it's, it's pretty here, but not like the Carolinas where you have this change of season and the leaves and all the things. But in my, at our house, we have leaves that are not just falling now. We have stuff that falls all year long. Like, I'm like, okay, I don't know how this happens. Well, I did a little research. And I, and, I, and I know this is true. Love my neighbor. He's got these giant live oak trees that come over into our yard. Um, loved him. He's the best neighbor ever. I discovered live oak. You know when, they, you know when the leaves fall off a of live oak? In the springtime. The leaves die now through the winter, but they stay there. Here's the point. You know why they fall off in the spring? Because the new leaves are coming in, right? The, the new leaves push out the dead ones and they finally fall. They're already dead. They're just hanging on. And some of us, here's the, here's the this is an apt analogy for the Christian life. And the fact, what we've seen all, all throughout this passage. You can't simply say, I'm going to stop doing that. I, I got to quit that. You've got to replace it with the work that the Spirit is doing in you, who you are becoming. Who are we becoming? Like Jesus. And so this week, the challenge is this, for you to remember who you are. And next week, we're going to talk about this a lot. You forgive. Why? Because you are forgiven. And if you do not forgive others, and this comes into our speech as well, if you do not forgive others, Jesus says you are not forgiven. What? To the degree you embrace his grace and his forgiveness in your life, you will extend it to others. None of us are worthy. And yet we're forgiven and we can forgive others and love each other. We can live with kind words, uplifting words, empowering words. Yes, with truth and with grace. And you can do it this week. Let that be our commitment. But we only do it because of the blood of Christ that's been shed for us. So let's, let's pray together, and then we're going to partake of, of the Lord's Supper together after we share in song together. Lord, we love you, and we praise you for your grace that's come to us. I pray for my brothers and sisters here. I pray for those who have never received your grace. Friend, listen, if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you never had a moment, you can, you can receive his grace right now. And you can say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've sought to validate my life, justify my life by my own works, and I cannot do it. I'm tired. And friend, that's when your life has changed. Give him your life and say, Lord, I need you. He died on the cross for your sin. He's absorbed all of your grief. He's absorbed all of your sin, 
all of the words you wish you had never spoken and words that you have received from others that have not been uplifting, kind and empowering words of life. By his death, he has absorbed all of that to set us free so that the new, the new life can come as we set aside the old. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you for the blood of Christ as we pause to remember what you have done for us. Because we know it's nothing but the blood of Jesus that has set us free. So now we ponder that, what we've heard, talk to the Lord, worship him, even now as you prepare your heart.